Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Som TV Podcast. My name is Jason Wise. We have a special episode for you today. We're going to talk about Pinot Noir, Sonoma, and a seven-year journey to make wine from the ground up by building your own vineyard. We have a new episode on Som TV of Behind the Glass about Ross Knoll Vineyard, and its founder, Diane Carpenter, has spent the last seven years designing a vineyard and going through all of the trials and tribulations that one could go through during this process. She's going to be on the podcast, and she's joined by Kelly Cornett of A Cork in the Road. She is a wine event education and media specialist based in Atlanta, Georgia, and knows a thing or two about Pinot Noir and Diane's wines. Before we get to that, I just want to tell you, Som TV is 50% off an entire year. Go to SomTV.com and use the code 50 off. Without further ado, my conversation about Pinot Noir, Sonoma, and the incredible journey of starting your own vineyard. It is wonderful to have you ladies on the Som TV podcast. You know, this is just getting some friends together and talking about Pinot Noir. It reminds me of college, you know, just really good stuff. <laughs> Kelly, <laughs> I don't know what, don't know what you were drinking you wine to. in college, Jason. <laughs> Hell no. Wow. In, in college, just to, really quickly, I was just going to parties and there'd be bathtubs full of like Kool Aid and vodka and whatever they mixed up. So they called it Pinot Noir, though. So I, that's what I thought it was. Diane is the executive producer of Psalm Into the Bottle, which I know is many of your favorites of the film, and Psalm 3, the upcoming Psalm Cup of Salvation. And Kelly is joining us from a Cork in the Road podcast. We're going to talk about Pinot Noir as a grape, some of the best Pinots, favorite Pinots we've ever had, maybe the most influential. I think it's hard, and I'll try not to talk about Sideways too much, but for the American audience, I think Pinot Noir really, 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 whether Sideways had a part for them, really started getting exposed to Pinot Noir in grocery stores. I mean, if you're in Los Angeles, like I am, liquor stores have tons and tons of Pinot Noir. And it wasn't really always like this. So what I wanted to do is ask you, Kelly, what your relationship was with this grape and when it sort of became such a big part. And you've been in wine quite a while, so has Diane, so have I. What's your thoughts on on this grape? Well, I was thinking about my historical perspective with this grape, but I had to go back many years to think about this. I've been drinking Pinot Noir since I probably started drinking wine. And it has been something that has fascinated me for so many years. And I think I've developed an interest in the way that this grape in particular showcases place. It takes me to a place when it is made well and when it is when it is made with care. I can drink a Pinot Noir and I can smell the place if I've been there, I can picture the place. It is so particular, and I love that about this grape. But for me, I had kind of an eye-opening experience in 2012 with my dad trekking around Willamette Valley. At the time, I was working full-time for a winery in Virginia, but I really didn't know much about the grape, and my dad loved it. So we spent an entire weekend in Willamette Valley, and there in 2012, like, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed in the wine industry, I was tasting single vineyard Pinot Noirs next to each other while standing next to these vineyards where they're grown. And it was just like fascinating. I hadn't had that before. I hadn't had that many nuance, like six, seven, single vineyard of the same grape. And then I was like, okay, tell me more. I'm in. So Oregon, thank you <laughs> for fascinating me more than 10 years ago. And, you know, then you get on the train and now you're learning about Burgundy and you're doing all these things. But yeah, Oregon, that's it for me. Yeah, I Oregon is one of these places that I, I'm not sure it'll never get enough credit for how good the wines are. And that's fine by me because the last thing I needed to, are the prices going up anymore. I'll just say really fast, as a bartender, Pinot Noir was not... It was not at the elevated place when I was bartending in film school and doing all the stuff that it is now. It was not really... It was a buy. It was a buy the glass wine, but it wasn't this thing where people knew about DRC, knew about Burgundy. It was a very smaller thing. But then by the time I released some, there's probably no correlation with this. But when I released some, Pinot Noir had taken this route, and this is around the time when I met you, Diane. Mm -hmm. And when I met you, I have to say your taste in wine is been a massive driver for not only my taste in wine, but also my spending way too much money on wine. <laughs> One of the things that you've always come with is Burgundy. So I'll ask really quickly, because we will get to you going through the seven-year odyssey of planting your own vineyard and really going through everything you could have gone through to do that. 
Mm-hmm. What is your personal experience with Pinot? Is it mostly Burgundy focused? No, it's not actually. So I'm a huge white Burgundy fan. My go-to grapes are Chardonnay and uh, Pinot Noir, but Chardonnay only from white Burgundy and um, Pinot Noir primarily from North America. There was a gateway to Pinot Noir and that was the Cabernet Sauvignon for me. And the reason I say that was because I had an epiphany after a glass of Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. So that was my gateway into American wine. And it was just a few months after that, that somebody poured me a a Walter Hansel winery, Pinot Noir. And he poured me a glass of wine from the Cuvée Alice vineyard of Stephen Hansel, who's the proprietor of the, uh, the winery. Yeah, this is Sonoma. And I was like, holy cow, I thought that cab was good, but this could be, this is good too. This is really, really great. And for me, it was more palatable because it was lighter and it was a wine that I could pick up immediately and just thoroughly enjoy and just just say, wow, this is just lovely in, in every way possible. It's lovely with food. It's, it's by itself. It stands out. And I always have a saying that a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon is for three people and uh, Pinot Noir is for one or two because <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite often one in my house because sometimes to me, it's such an an enjoyable, easy drinking wine that I feel that I don't have to delve too deep into because it's, it's just enjoyable right off the bat. With a cab, I'm like, okay, how much cabs? How much cabs in this? How much Merlot's in this? I'm always kind of pulling it apart, trying to figure it out. How much oak? But I find I don't do that with a Pinot Noir. I just find it pleasant right off the bat. But but I am drinking beautiful Pinot Noirs. You're drinking the right stuff. <laughs> the thing about Pinot, where you were saying it, it represents place. I would say Pinot Noir represents everything. If you if you put anything into it, if you use oak, if you leave it on the skins too long, if you do X, you do Y, it is like it takes a snap of a finger to represent. And if you're making a larger volume Pinot Noir, which is the case for a lot of the stuff you can find, and by the way, it does not mean grocery store wine. You can find good stuff in the grocery store. It more just means a lot of what we're served is not, I think, representative of how good the grape can actually be. And I really do feel like when we did Psalm and Psalm 2, there was this thing with sommeliers and wine writers where their number one thing they would mention is, I love Burgundy. And then something turned where it went to Syrah or went to Grenache and it became this like, we have to buck back. And I think some of that is due to the natural, like something got popular. So I have to say it's not cool anymore. But when you're talking about the level of Pinot and that's not necessarily cost, but the level of like well-made Pinot which I believe exists in Santa Barbara, it exists in Sonoma, it exists in, of course, it exists all over France, the Loire, Burgundy. But I think that when you're talking about that stuff, it is still one of the unassailable, most incredible grapes that can be made. But my favorite thing about it is it should only be made in a few places. I mean, it really should. Well, you just made kind of a huge, huge point there, Jason, because it's made almost everywhere because people people know the grape. It's so familiar and it's something that f- people feel comfortable ordering off a menu. They feel comfortable giving it to their friends, pulling off a shelf. If you don't know producer, you know the grape. So it's made everywhere for lots of different reasons, but you just kind of pointed to something of when it's done well, it stands above the rest and it does represent everything from a place, from a region, from a producer. So it can range tremendously within even price brackets. So you just made kind of that like, yes, they're making it because it sells. Oh, 100%. And I think every grape has gone through this. You know, Chardonnay's gone through it. Chardonnay's still battling this where people still think they don't like Chardonnay and then they don't know Chablis is from from that grape. They don't know Champagne's made from that grape. Pinot Noir, I think if you exclude the Champagne element of Pinot Noir, I, I really do believe that There are certain places and then there are not. And that is my personal opinion. I truly believe that Pinot Noir is probably the most pampered grape on the market. It needs nurturing. It needs love. (laughs) You know, it needs so much care. It's like this very delicate flower, right? And you need to pay it a lot of attention. Jason, you touched on something. I think what makes a wine great is great winemaking. And with great winemaking comes good people. Uh, passionate people, knowledgeable people uh, who put their time and energy into producing a product. And Pinot Noir is one of those. So when somebody has put 100% into winemaking into Pinot Noir, it is spectacular. 
And it's a grape, in my opinion, where you cannot cut corners because it's noticeable if you cut corners. Yeah. But, you know, it all depends on how it's made. <laughs> well, why don't, we, why don't we talk about some of our mo- most impactful bottles we've had from a Pinot standpoint? Kelly, I'll start with you, then I'll go, and then, then it'll do to Diane. But I think cost is always a factor in this, you know, and I'll try to not swing hard. But what do you got, Kelly? Oh, okay. So I had a really hard time narrowing down on my Pinot Noir memories. And when it comes to specific bottles, it was like going back in the archives. Like I was scrolling back in photos. I was looking back at texts to my family, like, because I usually send them pictures of things I enjoy. (laughs) I was going that deep because I feel like I've had a lot of really good Pinot Noirs in my life. Of course, when I had to narrow it down, I'm going to go with something more recent. So that's what came to me the most. And I will say that my most recent trip to Sonoma County, I finally made the drive up to Anderson Valley. I drank a lot of the wines up there, but I had never been to the place. We made the trip up from, we were staying in Sebastopol, and we drove up to Anderson Valley for the day, which you absolutely can do. It's definitely a trek. Your ears will pop. You go over the mountains and all the things, but then you come into Anderson Valley and all of a sudden the wines make sense. It's cool. There's big pine trees. There's like eagles flying. It's, it smells kind of salty in the air. I mean, it is, it's wild to me. You're getting closer to the coast. And so for me, I sat down at our first tasting appointment that day, excited about the way the place smelled and what I had seen driving in. And we sat down at a place called Lichen Estate and it is in Anderson Valley. And it tasted like I expected and hoped and wanted it all to taste. And that to me is when I have a really wonderful Pinot Noir memory is when I can see the place and smell it and it all makes sense. And that happened to me at Lycan with their Pinot Noir. It was pretty magical for wine geek moment. It was one of those full, full sense experiences. (laughs) <laughs> that's pretty great. That's that's amazing. It's really, I will say, it's hard to separate experience from wine because you don't drink wine in a vacuum. And the problem with, well, we'll get to mine. Did you have another bottle or is that the bot? That's the one. No, not the one. That's just the most recent one <laughs> because, I, because I have a hard time remembering. I think if I'm going to kind of understanding the capacity of Pinot Noir and its depth, I could probably go into total archives of I've been so lucky enough to go to Burgundy a couple times, and we've actually gone with the Chevalier de Tastevan dinners in um, in the like in the heart of Bone, and I've had so many amazing wines. But the problem with recalling particular bottles from those dinners is that they are not labeled with producer. So I could not tell you who produced those wines, but I can right. tell you that the dinners that I've had and uh, Chateau de Clove Joe, those wines, I think all of we'll just say all. Can we just say all of them? Does that just count? Yeah. But whoever makes wine for those dinners, I salute you. Those Pinot Noirs have been outstanding and shown me the possibility that Pinot can be. Well, you know, the problem I have with this question is, you know, I have 16 years of filming and we did a huge, in Psalm 3, we did a, essentially a judgment of Paris type thing on Pinot Noirs. You know, Jancis Robinson opened up like a, I think it was a 62 Amaros. I mean, th- this like legendary might have been the last bottle in the world type of situation. And so, you know, there's blind tasting sessions with Latash. There's all these different things where I've, of course, had these wines. But in Into the Bottle, you know, the the experience we had at Domaine de Lormani Conti, and you can watch that, is pretty tremendous. And the reason I want to call that bottle out is that was Aubert de Valen's least favorite vintage he had ever made. Ever made. And it wasn't, um, he didn't pour Latash, he didn't pour DRC. You know, he poured Echezo, not Grand Echezo. And it was a vintage where, he doesn't say this on camera, but it's famous for millions of ladybugs getting into the fermenters in this in this vintage. <laughs> and it's called the ladybug vintage. They don't like that. But this bottle, he was going to open up something. He's like, I'll open up this, this, or this. These are like $10,000 bottles of wine. And I said, I'm not really interested in that because all you're going to say is, well, this is good. And he said, so what do you want? And I said, well, I'd like you to open up something that was your most challenging. And he opened up that bottle. And I will tell you, this bottle was so magnificent. It was so good. And he just kept saying, look, you know, it needs another 10 years. It'll come to come into its own. And I'm looking up from this glass of wine like, you know, holy shit. I mean, this is, this bottle is perfect. And so that to me, it's at a very different price point, different price level, but this is probably, you know, this is like the Van Gogh of, of making wines with that grape. And for him to be like, this is my least proud moment is like, you're, 
least proud moment is probably one of the best wines I've ever tasted experience. I was in the cellar, you know, I was at the RC. So obviously that's, there's a lot to that, but that particular bottle of wine, which you can see in the movie is magnificent, but it goes to show that price, you know, is, is a big thing. And of course, you know, we're talking about one of the greatest States. I also had this very interesting experience at a wine bar about five or six years ago. I had a Sancerre Rouge from Le Herce, which is, you know, it's a good producer. It's not something that collectors are thinking about. It was a 2000 and they had this on the line list and it was, I want to say it was a $60 bottle. It still to this moment, I was just a random, we just needed a bottle of wine and it totally made me realize that Pinot Noir from Sancerre in the Loire Valley is so criminally underpriced, underrated. And this bottle of wine, I wish to God I could get another one. It's just one of the most memorable things and there's nothing filming attached to it. It's nothing great story. It just happened to be the wine took over the conversation. It was an incredible, incredible bottle. So please don't drive the price up on Sancerre Rouge because it's <laughs> uh, it's really great. Diane, what what are some bottles that really took you? Well, it was bottles and people, right? So um, bottles... Walter Hansel Winery took me to Sonoma for my first visit when I was uh, 40, so some years back. And having that one-on-one -on -one experience with Stephen Hansel as he as we tasted through, you know, his recent vintage of Pinot Noirs was just, I just fell in love instantly. It was just so delicate. It was so palatable and so easy to drink all by itself. We had no food with, with us. And so I would say that that wine turned me onto Pinot Noir. And then so as I do, I started studying Pinot Noir a little bit more. And um, I was harvesting up there at the time. You know, that's, that's what brought me to Sonoma in the first place. I started harvesting. I was harvesting with Paul Hobbs and he makes some stunning Pinot Noirs as well. So I was trying some very well-made Pinot Noirs with, um, with all the interns. And so I surrounded myself with winemakers. I got to know them. I got to hear their stories. I got to taste their wines. I got to taste out of barrels. And so it, I just came at it uh, at a very different perspective than most people. For me, it wasn't walking into a wine store or a grocery store and buying a bottle of wine. It, for me, it was an experience, a, a continuous experience because I was actually there. But then I met Eric Sussman from Radio Coteau. He poured me a glass of his Clos Platt vineyard Pinot Noir, which was 100% Calera, the Calera clone. And in a moment, I'm like, holy cow, this, this, if my wine can taste as good as this, then I've succeeded. This is what I want to do. And that's why we ended up selecting 100% Calera for our vineyard in Sonoma. And as time went on, I was poured a Mount Eden clone, Pinot Noir, and that was my second love. And I knew that that was the second clone. I knew that at that point, there were really only two clones I wanted to work with. Diane, a, a lover of cloning. I love this. I love it. I love single clones. I love what they represent, what they bring to a wine. And she also knows what she likes, like immediately, like, oh, oh yes. yep, I'm all in. Like, I like yeah, that clone. Always. Whole vineyard. Let's go. <laughs> Well, it's important to mention because I think most people, wine industry or not, they'll turn their head towards France when it comes to Pinot, but it's really important to, to stay focused on Sonoma because in the 50s, I think it was 53, Hansel Winery mm -hmm. made their first Pinot. And this Pinot Noir, so what Hansel did really had no market value. It really didn't, it didn't have anything, any proven concept, but they, they produce one of the greatest red wines, let alone Pinot Noirs in the world, and, and have since 53. But what they did from a pioneer standpoint, I think there was a 25-year period where they were the absolute benchmark of Pinot Noir. Before Pinot Noir really, you know, Burgundy meant something. In America, you could buy hearty Burgundy at the grocery store, and it was an American-made red blend. It wasn't even Pinot. So the name Burgundy started to get diluted, and people started to think Pinot Noir as an actual commodity. And in the 80s, a winery named William Selium under some of what I think are the most gifted, vision-forward winemakers that ever lived in Sonoma as well, started making something where they were like, we can actually make Burgundy in California. And they set out with that mission. And I don't. I think without those two wineries, and then you have places like Radio Coteau, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. that really took this to, I think it's full fruition, where now in Sonoma, you have wineries that are at Geez, small scale all the way to large scale with real history that are making Pinot, and it's tremendous. 
it just has to be said about Sonoma how pioneering that place was for Pinot. And so now it's one thing, Diane, to say, I like this grape. It's one thing to say I might have some money to, to get a property. As you learned, the hardest <laughs> way possible, it's a totally other thing to say, I am going to actually do this. And then, much like any marriage, go through the slings and arrows of what it's like to mm. be in a relationship. Why don't we just talk just for a few minutes about what you went through, which everybody can watch on the documentary on Sime TV, which I encourage you to do because it's great. Why don't you go through some of the things that you went through to plant this? So the, the hardships of planting a vineyard. So you know how many sommeliers ask, you know, tell me I'm going to, I'm going to plant a vineyard and I'm going to make wine. And the first thing, I, there's a few things I say to them. First thing is, well, I hope you've got lots of money. <laughs> and then I try and steer everybody away from, you know, planting a vineyard and just purchase perfect grapes because there's so many perfect grapes to purchase, right? The second thing is, I hope that you're really prepared to get your hands dirty because my goodness, your life's about to turn upside down. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was guided by the best people. And I got the best people just from word of mouth, from one person to another. You know, we purchased the land, so we did have the land. And because of Joyce Sterling from Iron Horse Vineyards, who is my neighbor in Sebastopol, she introduced me to our viticulture team. And we were the smallest project they had ever taken on. And they never took on projects our size. But you know what? They were really interested in seeing this woman from the East Coast, well, from England, via New York City, <laughs> who ends up in Sonoma somewhere. And they're like, oh, we're not so sure this is going to happen. But she's definitely passionate. So maybe something's going to happen here. I didn't do all this on my own. I did this with a team of incredible people. And one of the first things you have to do is you have to find the right people to work with. Because if you don't have those people, you're just not going to get anywhere. One thing I do want to talk about, because we've we've extensively covered the wildfires that happened in 2019 mm. and then again in 2020. Yeah. Um, we have a whole film coming that is set right in the center of that. But the question I have is you made I think one of the all-time pivots I've seen somebody do. <laughs> and I want to talk about when the, when the wildfires came in, and we all know that there's a lot of debate as to how much fire, you know, messes with the grapes and permeates the skins and does all of this stuff. But it does have a, a major effect, and it's also a major effect on the worry of what it might do. So you have to make a right. choice. You right. don't have the option. You're either not harvesting or you're harvesting or you're doing something else. Tell me what you did to pivot when the fires happened. It seemed that as soon as we were ready to start making wine, there was Mother Nature threw something our way or something happened. So 2019, right? Our first vintage, we had a small vintage of rosé and the massive fires came through. Massive fires. But we'd already had the fires in 2017. Remember, Jason, right after we planted the vineyard, those fires came in and you cannot exaggerate what it's like to be surrounded by fire. It is absolutely terrifying. Oh, and by the way, I was on my own <laughs> when I was dealing with that as well. That was that was really, really scary, but I had great neighbors. We weren't picking that year, so we were fine, but winemakers were panicking. This was those who hadn't picked yet. They were panicking. They didn't really know what to do. In Sonoma, most people had picked already. So we, we were pretty fine. But in Napa, you know, the cabs weren't picked yet. And then in 2019, fires came through again. They came through again, but we'd already picked. So that was, that was okay. 2020 is the year that we had to pivot because in 2020, this big like smoke plume came in from Oregon, I believe, and just came down the, you know, Sonoma coast. And it was thick, thick smoke. And everybody was concerned about, well, what is the smoke going to do to the grapes? So we decided we're not going to take our chances. We decided we're going to pick. We, but Justin Seidenfeld, our consultant winemaker and I, this is what we do all the time. We're like always brainstorming what's next, what, what should we do? How should we pivot? What should we do? And um, we decided, okay, let's pick the grapes. Let's press them immediately off the skin so we don't, we have as little skin contact as possible because we don't know how the smoke was going to affect those skins. And this is when we decided to make a white Pinot Noir. So we, we pressed the grapes ever so slightly. So just the pulp inside you know, the clear pulp comes out. So the wine is pretty clear. You're always going to get a little bit of color. This is how we started making white Pinot Noir. We made it, it because of the smoke. White Pinot Noir is a, is a funny thing. Prior to you doing this, I have had it 
one or two other times, but it was much, it was a novelty. You kind of had to launch your brand on mm. something that you never expected to make, right? I no, mean, you were not like, I'm going to buy this land. I'm going to make white Pinot Noir. Yeah. It's freaking delicious. But my question to you is, what was the reception? What did people say? People were curious. I've never heard a negative comment about it ever. I mean, that's a beautiful thing because people are just curious. White Pinot Noir, it's a novelty. I've never had that before. And I'm like, well, neither have I really. But <laughs> I did have white Pinot Noir prior to this. And that was Grace Evanstadt's Domaine Seren's white Pinot Noir. 2022 is so far my favorite vintage, I have to say. We put a teeny bit of color on it. You know, you hold it up to the light, it looks completely white, but it's kind of like a blonde de noir champagne, right? There's a teeny, teeny bit of color to it. That's what you'll see looking at our white Pinot Noir. You have to look really close, but you will find it. It might be one of the strangest wines in the world if you were to blind taste somebody and they were all cellar temp. It would be, mm-hmm. I, I think if you had a blindfold on, it would be impossible. Honestly. It would absolutely fool me. And that's one of the things that is fascinating about that wine is that if it's room temperature and if I close my eyes, I don't know, my mind goes in a lot of different- Where are you going to go? Well, yeah, where, where do you go with that? It's intriguing. Kelly, why don't you describe what this wine actually tastes like? Because it is very fascinating. And I should say now you make you make your traditional Pinots and you have several different types and styles and and uh, they're excellent. And this is something that I want to get to where people can get this wine because they should. It is incredibly important. We feature some of the greatest wineries in the world on Som TV, but it's incredibly important to show what it takes to build a vineyard from the from just the land. The ground up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and what you accomplished is so incredible, but it's also, these are the vineyards that become those important magisterial vineyards of tomorrow are these ones like you're doing right now. Kelly, what does the Pinot Noir, the white Pinot Noir, taste like? Oh, I love that you asked me that right after Diane goes, it's really hard to describe. Kelly, yeah, take it exactly. away. <laughs> well, you know, you're a... You're 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 a taster. You know what you're I doing. I taste. I do taste. There's like this. There's a richer mouthfeel to it. The structure is what really pulled me in. When I blind taste, I think a lot of times I come to a final conclusion based on the structure of the wines, of where it is, or the winemaking choices, and the richer mouthfeel, the roundness on the palate. But there was still this backbone of acidity, and it really brought the lift in this white wine. So I knew it wasn't – I started doing all of the deletions in my mind. Like, this isn't Viognier. It's not Chardonnay. uh, It's not Sauvignon Blanc. Like, I was going through that process, but it made me think. And how exciting as a wine geek to be sitting on the back deck at happy hour and be thinking that excitedly about a wine. So I watched my husband taste it. He's like, this is really good. Like I could totally eat lots of different foods with this. And I was like, that's awesome because he's very good in the chef side of stuff. So I thought, okay, yes, a chef, a restaurant scene, this would be awesome. It has baked apple. It has pears. There's almost like a chamomile tea thing that happens. But also this vintage, the one that we shared in Atlanta, has this vanilla lemon meringue finish and even like a red apple skin. Like I was I was tasting it earlier this week and I was thinking there is a little bit of that whether it's a little Jedi mind trick, I don't know cuz you know it's a red grape, but there's a little bit of red component to it. So when you put that all together, you've got baked apple, pears, tea, honey, red fruit, red skin, and it's round on the palate, it does give a little bit more lift to that richness of the mouthfeel, I think, when it comes up to temperature. And you get those nuances between the fruit and the non-fruit components that shine in this beautiful white wine. It's so fun to share with people. You're yeah, so great, Kelly. Great. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's great. And, and you know, I, I should say, you know, we could talk forever about this, but your long journey to create the red wine you sought after making mm-hmm. paid off. Those wines are fantastic. I really do encourage everybody to watch the episode. Diane, where can people get your wine? Because if you're listening, you should. They don't have a lot of it, so you should probably We don't jump have a lot it. of it, especially the white Pinot Noir. If you go to uh, my website, rossnolvignard.com or diancarpenter.org, you look under wines. We've just put some wines up there. But we are going to be doing offerings occasionally. So if you join the mailing list you will get to participate in those offerings. And we're actually going to be doing $100 magnums coming up. There's absolutely no question. I will be buying those. <laughs> I will be buying those. those are, that's a great idea. I want to reiterate that everybody should watch the doc and go to rossnollvineyard.com to uh, definitely pick up these wines before they're gone. I want to thank you both for being on. I appreciate it. And uh, I hope everybody checks out your episode, Diane. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.
Thank you, everybody, for listening. I'm going to remind all of you that you can get Som TV for 50% off right now if you use the code 50OFF at SomTV.com. You can watch Diane's episode of Behind the Glass on Ross Knoll Vineyard there right now, and it's really a tremendous, beautiful story. So I recommend you watch that now. Don't forget our oyster film, The Oyster Farmer, a brand new Som TV original, so you can watch that now. And don't forget to pick up a bottle of Diane's wine. It is a labor of love and truly a great stuff. Everybody be safe. Cheers. Cheers.